you need to go to the Water Quality Parameters Quest. There you're going to find a link to Google Classroom. Log into your account and look for the Water Quality Research Notes assignment that has a graphic organizer for you to organize your information and, and take good notes. Click on the following websites link which will take you to a web page that I put together and if you scroll down you're going to find a bunch of links on Streamflow. This one it seems pretty easy but there's not a lot of information that's really straightforward that says this is good Streamflow for salmon, this is not. All we know for sure, what we hear is that when farmers moved into Chimicum Valley in the 1800s and they straightened the creek to allow irrigation for their farms, that was not good for fish. You think about a fry going down or going out to an estuary to get out to sea eventually and become a big fat salmon. If they're going full speed ahead and have nowhere to turn and, and rest and eat and hunt for those benthic macros, it's not going to survive. It's going to die. So naturally meandering creeks with woody debris to slow the water down and make slower pools. Even when we went down uh, uh, water quality testing, off to the side near where we were standing, they had fish there. We saw little fry just hanging out there. They weren't having to fight the current or, you know, go against the current just to keep from being washed uh, uh, all the way down. So that's, you know, really, that's what we know for sure about stream flow, or at least the speed that it's going. And when you measured the flow rate, you started by measuring how fast the water was moving. So remember that. The first link, water quality, uh, I mean water cycle stream flow, is a nice website with really good information just about overall water cycle and, and uh, rain. This just is a, especially if you weren't the water cycle expert, this will provide you some good background information. Now, the USGS uses the term stream flow to refer to the amount of water flowing in a river. All right, that's obvious, pretty straightforward. And it uses the term stream when discussing flowing water bodies. Uh, they use rivers, the word rivers, more than streams here. So rivers are important, we know that. Watersheds, uh, that picture that uh, Olivia and Sarah showed us showed the Chimicum Creek watershed. That really shows you where Chimicum Valley is. When we go to the Youth Summit, they will be talking about the Hood Canal watershed. We're in a different watershed, but really the way you treat your watershed is the same no matter where you live. You want to make sure you take care of your watershed. This tells you about how stream flow is changing. So we went multiple days and we saw that it does change day to day, even minute to minute even if there is no rain. So this is an important one for you to read, get some ideas. And uh, this talks about precipitation and stream flow. That's another good one. So read that. And this gives you some information about stream flow and gallons per second, which is nice because that's the way we measured it. <laughs> and there's a huge change right there. The next link stream flow, uh, that one gets more into what we need to know. Stream flow or discharge is the volume of water flowing in a stream channel expressed as a unit per time. They use cubic feet per second, we did gallons per second. It's an important determinant of water quality and aquatic habitat, that's why we measure it. High water temperature, low levels of dissolved, dissolved oxygen, uh, Levels of toxin, pollution, can all be made worse, that's what exacerbated means, by low stream flow. So you want a good amount of water flowing through there at a pretty good speed. Um, let's see, the quantity, quality, and connectivity of aquatic habitats, habitats, of course, they're influenced by stream flow. Like I said, if you straighten it out and it's flowing too fast, there's not much habitat there, not much place for even the bugs to survive. Um, oh yeah, 
So stream flow, it says here, is also a powerful determinant of aquatic habitat conditions through the effects of peak flood events. When we get rains, our creek will flood. Not really bad because it's a small creek, but that affects the, the habitat and the salmon. And, and if we have trees, it'll prevent erosion and increasing the size of the stream banks. And this gets into, so the more stream you have, you're going to have the, the sediments from the creek being deposited on the sides, and that affects the meander and, and the shape. And North Olympic Salmon Coalition, they have helped meander the creek just to make it uh, a, a good habitat for the salmon. And that's why we have so many different species of fish in our creek. So this is a short one, but it's got good stuff for you. Now the next one on our list, the uh, how stream flow is measured, is really important. So let's take a look at this one. Okay, so here's here's where we were, measuring the creek. I mean, I'm talking hypothetically here. You measured how fast the water was moving, and you some of you measured it in feet per second, some of you measured it in meters per second. Let's say it was feet per second. That just tells you how fast it's moving. That is not a volume. That is just a straight line speed measurement. Uh, what we needed to do was find out how wide the creek was. So I measured the width of it and an average depth. Okay, so this is the depth. Now, creeks are not perfect rectangles, so I couldn't just do length times width. Okay? Um, what I did was I estimated, and I came up with an estimate for the volume of the creek right in the middle where you took one of your measurements. Uh, the middle is where it's going the slowest because it's at its widest, and I thought that would give us a good volume. So I measured the volume, uh, which is area, feet times feet, gave me square feet. Well, if I multiply feet per second times feet squared, the feet are going to become cubic feet. So that's feet cubed per second. Well, that went from telling me speed to how much water is moving through there every second. And I just converted cubic feet into gallons per second. And on the spreadsheet, you can click on each cell and see the numbers I use to multiply that um, and to convert these. I just looked them up so I could tell I was actually doing it correctly. And that's how you got your flow rate. You need to explain that. You can't just tell people, yeah, we stuck this um, pole in the water with a propeller and that gave us the stream flow. No, it didn't. It gave you the speed. You need to tell them that. And you need to explain this to show how you went from how fast the water's moving to how much water's moving through there at a given point. So that's important thing. That's why I included uh, this website in here. And you can read about it. It even has a, a, a way to get the area of a cross section of your creek. Now this one, um, I believe is flow rate for trout hatchery. You're going to look at it and you're going to say, whoa, that's a huge document with a lot of information. But I highlighted some parts and I just did this to give you some reference. It's, it, this is a, for a hatchery. And if you look at the first thing I highlighted, check this out. A small trout farm capable of producing up to 100,000 pounds of trout per year will require a continuous water flow of at least 500 gallons per minute. That's per minute, but that's a hatchery. They're standing still. They're not in a creek. So ours, you're going to say, well, ours was, oh, was 300 per second. That's a lot more water, but this is a hatchery. Just want you to get a perspective. And then this says flow rates for vertical or horizontal tray incubators are four to six gallons per minute. Whoa, so in a hatchery, the water's moving very slowly and very little of it, uh, just enough to keep them aerated so there's enough dissolved oxygen and to keep 
the water moving and cold. It's got to be cold. So DO and, and temperature people, you can learn from them why those are important factors. Um, now the flow rate for each jar was adjusted so that the eggs are lifted to 50% of the standing depth of eggs. Now eggs in a creek, they don't have to go through this. This is just to give you a frame of reference. In a creek, they're laid at the bottom in the red that the female made with her tail. And that water, you know, to talk to turbidity people, has to be clear, has to be cold, has to have enough dissolved oxygen flowing through so the eggs can survive and hatch into alvin. Salmon experts will know about this. So that's why I included uh, this there, just to give you a frame of reference. And then this stream flow of questions, uh, you know, somebody asked, how does the volume of a stream affect its flow rate? I thought this was a good question. Read that. It'll give you an answer by an actual scientist uh, back in 2007, but the answer is still valid. This doesn't change. So you've got that there. And then we've got some other things. Uh, this stream flow, effect of stream flow on salmon. Now I always open the link in a new tab. I right click so I can still have my links and have my website on another tab. So it says here, read stream flow paragraph after you learn what PDO means. So this is gonna help you uh, get some more information on climate change and, and stream flow. So you're gonna learn what PDO is, okay? Uh, and, and it is about the Pacific North, so that's where we live, and that climate phenomenon is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. This will make you so smart at any gatherings you have with your family or friends. Um, and then you're going to read, there's the salmon population one, ooh that's pretty good, but here's the stream flow one. An increase in area regional stream flow has been recorded during positive PDO years. Uh, I thought this would be interesting and maybe you could even talk about it at the Youth Summit or share it on your website. Now, if you get stuck on what PDO is or this part, call me over, we will discuss it. Discuss it with your teammate though to see if you get it because this will be amazing information. Then you got a link on uh, salmon habitat and limiting factors. That's what affects flow rate, read those. And of course, you will enjoy the watershed story. It's really good. So uh, yeah, this should totally make you a complete expert on flow rate and be able to share your graphs and data and talk about what that flow rate means about Chimicum Creek and how our creek is doing, especially the data going back to 2002. You have got a great history right there.